Welcome. Welcome to our, our, our program. Um, the ICWA, uh, as some, most of you know, is, to, is a, to serve as a kind of the premier organization in Indiana to bring important international topics to the citizens of Indiana. In addition to our distinguished speaker series, we also hope a host uh, the Great Decision Series in the spring, and that focuses on topics developed by the uh, Foreign Policy Association. Uh, we also sponsor and host the Academic World Quest pr program, which is a uh, quiz bowl type program for high school students. Uh, we're always speak seeking uh, new participants for that program. If you're a student or a faculty member at a high school and you're interested, you can check our website for, for details about that. Uh, if you're like our programs, uh, we invite you to become a member of the Indiana Council on World Affairs. Um, we're an all-volunteer organization, and our membership fees uh, directly support our programs. Um, and although our programs are free, we kind of urge you to uh, generously donate when you, when you sign up, and uh, that helps us uh, keep up the high quality of our programs. Um, just a little housekeeping here. Uh, if you would, please make sure you're muted. Uh, during the program. Uh, during que question and answer session later on, you'll be able to unmute yourself. Um, anytime during the program, you'll be able to send a question uh, through the uh, chat room. Uh, the questions will go to uh, Larry Cimino, which you, who you also see on our screen here. And uh, Larry will uh, be taking care of the question and answer. If you'd like to ask a question uh, in person, uh, just write that in the chat, say, Larry, I'd like to ask the question myself, and he'll be glad to, to accommodate you. Uh, tonight, we are pleased to present the uh, cost of doing business, crime and corruption in the modern, wor modern world. And I'd like to introduce Larry Chimino, who will introduce our uh, distinguished speaker. Uh, most, I'm sure most of you will recognize um, Larry. Uh, Larry is the immediate past president of the Indiana Council on World Affairs and served four terms as our volunteer president, and he remains very active on our program committee. And uh, those of us on the board really appreciate all the effort Larry's put in over the years. Uh, Larry is uh, currently president of ProConsult, a uh, strategic global, global management and logistics consultancy focused on mental health and comorbidity of medical and mental disorders. Uh, he retired from Eli Lilly and Company after 32 years with management roles in international marketing, international government relations, and as president of Eli Lilly and Company Foundation. Uh, he has significant experience working in Africa and the Middle East, and uh, where he earned it, uh, learned to navigate legally under the structures of the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which will be uh, discussed in some detail this evening. Um, Larry is currently the uh, Global Pro Program Director for Diagnose excuse me, for dialogue and diabetes on depression and international effort addressing problems related to the co-occurrence of diabetes and depression. Uh, this is under the auspices of the Association for the Improvement of Mental Health Programs, uh, which is located in Geneva, Switzerland. It's a, uh, an NGO that is based there. Uh, Larry's a native of Oklahoma, Oklahoma, excuse me, Omaha, Nebraska. I shouldn't say Oklahoma, wow. That's an insult there to Nebraskans. Uh, Larry graduated from the University of Toronto with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature and Communication. Larry, welcome. Thanks very much, Ray, and good to see so many uh, old friends out there. I'm certainly glad to be uh, uh, to continue to be associated with uh, our Council on World Affairs. It's been a great organization, and uh, uh, as you know, people from all over the country can become members. In fact, we have a lot of folks on the line here from across the country, uh, as well as from Canada. So hello to a bunch of old friends out there and welcome to new folks who haven't uh, joined us before. I hope this will be the first of uh, many programs that you have a chance to see. Our distinguished speaker this evening is someone who studies the phenomenon of global crime and corruption and could help us understand why we should know and care about this. James Long is a professor of political science, adjunct professor of public policy and a co-founder of the Political Economy Forum at the University of Washington. He's the host of the forum's podcast series, Neither Free Nor Fair, about election security and democracy in the 21st century. Dr. Long is a faculty affiliate at UC Berkeley's Center for Effective Global Action and Evidence 
in governance and politics. Previously, James was an academy scholar at the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies, a dissertation fellow at the Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation, a Jennings Randolph Peace Scholar at the US Institute of Peace, and a Fulbright Scholar. His research on Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, published in dozens of papers and book chapters, focuses on democratization and corruption in developing countries. His forthcoming book with Danielle Jung is titled, The Social Origins of Electoral Participation in Emerging Democracies. And he teaches the popular undergraduate class Global Crime and Corruption at the University of Washington. Dr. Long received his PhD in political science from UC San Diego, an MSc with merit in African politics from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and a BA with high honors in international relations and history from the College of William and Mary in beautiful and historic Williamsburg, Virginia. Good evening, Dr. Long, and welcome to our ICWA Distinguished Speakers broadcast this evening. You're certainly the right person to talk about this topic. Thanks, Larry. Uh, to start us off, can you tell us exactly what you mean by global crime and corruption, sort of what the parameters for our discussion tonight are going to be, and just why this is a problem that the U.S. and we as citizens should be concerned with? Sure. Well, first, let me thank you and Ray for that very uh, generous introduction. And thanks to the Indiana Council on World Affairs for inviting me. And thank you all for being here today. Corruption is one of those words that's just sort of bandied about. And it sort of means everything and nothing at the same time. And I think a lot of people actually don't sort of know what it means at a technical level. So I would like to define corruption, specifically political corruption, as the abuse of public office for private gain. Okay, and I think we can think of three parts of that. The first one is public office. So when we talk about political corruption, we're talking about there being some sort of political person, actor, institution involved at some level. Perhaps they're the one um, being the target of a corrupt act. Perhaps a citizen is trying to bribe a public official, or perhaps it's a public official who's actually engaging in the corrupt act themselves. But we really mean something that has a public official, whether we're talking about a prosecutor, a judge, a member of the legislature, even the person who gives the uh, who gives you your license at the DMV. These are all potentially uh, uh, public officials. The second part is the abuse of office. Basically, they're breaking the rules somehow. And the third aspect is private gain, which means that in our definition of corruption, the person is benefiting personally. Now, this is a little bit tricky because, of course, public officials make a salary. You know, they get paid to do a job. That is not what we consider corruption. They're not abusing that. That's just them getting their salary. But it's, if they were to do something above and beyond that, that personally benefits them, like accept a bribe, for example, that would be considered corruption. So, again, it's the abuse of public office for private gain. Now, in his question, Larry asked, or Larry made the statement global. What, what do we mean by global crime and corruption or global political corruption? Well, when I approach this issue and when I teach on it, I basically say, I can't think of, at least in the 21st century, a corrupt action that occurred that didn't have some international or transnational dynamic to it, particularly for talking about the developing world. So it could be that a politician is being bribed in another country but the business itself could be coming from another country. The uh, money that's being used could be laundered through various countries. Um, and the impact in that country could be very, very uh, important locally, but it could also uh, matter in the region as well. If, for example, whatever corrupt action is affecting people domestically, uh, take human trafficking, for example, and that humans are then being trafficked across borders. It could affect a country's neighbors. So I, I sort of put global there just in recognition of the fact that no one country is an island when it comes to corruption and no one country is immune to it either. This is a global problem. Even the countries that we consider the cleanest and that always get the best ratings like Denmark and New Zealand, Iceland, they still have uh, corruption problems in their country as well. So I, re I really see it as a global problem um, in addition to sort of something that is gonna happen domestically within a country. 
Good, good. Uh, this may be really naive, but in the, we're in the 21st century. And why do you think political crime and public sector corruption continue to plague the countries in the modern world, including some of those developed countries you talked about? And what would you say are the motivations of individuals and groups that commit criminal and corrupt acts in this way? I think corruption persists because it pays. Um, I think people benefit from it. And um, I, mean, I mean, I think they directly benefit from it or they think they're gonna benefit from it. I mean, maybe they try and it, it's not successful. So I think corruption persists for those reasons, but I think corruption happens for a number of different reasons. And the way I tend to think about it is kind of a different uh, levels of analysis or units of analysis. I think we can think of, particularly when we're talking about the public sector, um, I always use the example of say a DMV office. Um, and you have the manager who runs the office, but then you have the day-to-day -day workers within that office, right? And any of us who've worked in a bureaucracy, I work for a university, know that there's sort of different levels of managers and workers. Well, one of the reasons corruption can persist is because maybe the managers aren't overseeing what the, the workers are doing. Maybe the managers and the workers are both on the take together and trying to accept a bribe. For example, if you take the DMV, you know, why wait in line to take a driver's test? and you know, fill out all the paperwork, if you could pay a bribe to an official to cut the line, okay, maybe that official at the desk is sharing that with their manager or they're somehow colluding. So we can think about how these public agencies are governed as being an area where they're not supposed to be breaking the rules, but a lot of times they are, and they are in concert with other people who work with them. We can also think about the political system more generally, like, are, does a government, does an executive branch have a legislative branch that has checks and balances? Is there an independent judiciary that's capable of overseeing and prosecuting corruption? So I think we can think about corruption persisting at the system level as well, if those checks and balances and institutions aren't in place. And then my favorite, which kind of racks my brain, and it's as a social scientist, it's kind of the limit of where I think I can go, which is at the, just the level of the individual person. You know, maybe corruption is just something that a particular type of personality uh, is likely to engage in, or maybe there's just a psychology to human beings that, you know, we may say that we don't like cheating or we don't want the system to be abused, but at the end of the day, we, we would all individually or a lot of us would skim off the top or cut corners or pay a little, you know, pay a little uh, something here or there if we could, or if we did run an entire business or we did run an entire country, there's just something you know, rotten or, or wrong in individuals or a lot of individuals in their psychology that causes them to um, commit these corrupt actions. And so I think even at the level of the individual person and their personality and their psychology, we can also think of that being a source of where corruption comes from. We say power corrupts and uh, you know, having that, uh, that control over the, the situation, I think is tempting for a lot of people, isn't it? Yeah. Well, all right. How do you recognize the line that separates the legitimate costs of competing for business with a, a corrupt act? I mean, this part of our the title of this is a, is it part of the price of doing business? Have you going to be in international business? That is a great question, and it's a very hard question to answer because one of the one of the reasons corruption is is very difficult to understand, but also very interesting is that what is considered corrupt in one country or illegal in one country may not be considered illegal or corrupt in another country. And so a lot of the ways that we think about, well, you know, if a business tries to get a sweetheart deal to open up a plant in a specific country, that may not technically be against the law, that may not even really be corrupt, um, even if it seems somewhat unseemly. And so typically what we do is we think of there are three standards of corruption. There, there are three standards by which an action could be considered corruption, and some of it overlaps, and they're not all necessary for something to be considered corrupt. But the first standard is the standard of public interest. Does the action help or hurt the public interest? The second one is a standard of public opinion. Do people, everyday citizens, view something as corrupt or not? Okay, and there I think culture is really interesting, you know. Is tipping a waiter in the United States kind of like paying a bribe? Like, is that like culturally we see that as, oh, they're providing a service for us and, and we're supposed to reward that. But in other cultures, you can imagine essentially paying a waiter or a server not to spit in your food is sort of like if you, if you feel like it's extortion or it's a bribe, right? 
So public opinion can be a standard. And then the third one is the standard of law. What does the actual law say? Now, what's interesting, Larry, in answer to your question is for a long time, scholars, social scientists, particularly some economists and political scientists didn't actually think corruption was a bad thing. Um, we only sort of now recognize that corruption can directly hurt uh, a country's growth rate or uh, prospects for democratization and rule of law. But in the 20th century, it was actually sort of fairly common for a lot of social scientists to say, look, when a country is, particularly when a country is very poor developing, corruption really is the cost of doing business, but you need business to thrive. You need there to be economic growth. And so if you have a company that comes into a country that's very, very poor, right? If we think of African countries becoming independent um, from colonial powers in the late 20th century, you know, if there is a business that has the assets that's capable of uh, producing uh, locally in an economy, if they can get sweetheart deals, if they can grease the wheels, but they start opening plants and they start employing people, that is the cost of doing business. Um, and that can actually help to generate economic growth at the early stages that a country has yet to, to become wealthy or really have that. The, the problem is, is that beyond a certain point, if businesses are, are engaging in corrupt actions, that then makes the system harmful to everybody else, then that actually at a certain point typically hurts productivity or hurts basically what a society is able to produce uh, at, at its maximum. And so it can both be true that it is the cost of doing business, and that may not be a bad thing in this in a certain context. On the other hand, if, if doing business or committing corrupt acts causes there to be social harm and a lack of growth, then that is bad. And so the cost of doing business is harmful in that sense. Yeah. We both worked in uh, in Africa and other other places where where a bakshish or a, 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 a bribe, if you will, is necessary to get your bag back from uh, from the from, from the <laughs> when, when the plane lands, or to get a room in a hotel that you know might have clean sheets and uh, and air conditioning. Uh, I mean, and, and those have nothing to do with violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, for example, because you're not paying to get the business, you're paying to, to survive in that environment, you know? And I think understanding that, it's just really a fine line that, uh, that we play, because yes, that's a form of corruption, but it's not a, a, a violation of trying to buy the business or, or competing with somebody who's, uh, you know, who is, who is violating the, uh, the act. So, uh, I mean, I, I think, learning to operate in those environments is, 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 is really difficult. And, uh, uh, but on the other hand, now, I mean, let's just think about, you know, how do you, when you start thinking about how do you stop this, who are those entities that investigate corrupt actions, that look for these things, that bring these incidents to light, that prosecute perpetrators, and how can we protect those people who uncover the truth and, uh, um, and, and protect the victims uh, of, of corruption when we're really talking about some of these major uh, uh, violations. Yeah, I think that's where I, so so let me first say that Larry, you, you remind me of a good point that I wanna make and I haven't, which is that corruption a lot of times can be illegal, but a lot of times corruption is not technically illegal, but it is unseemly or it is illicit. So the standard, that third standard I talked about with the law, gets you a lot of the way there, but it doesn't get you the entire way there. So for example, when non-Americans, and even when a lot of Americans learn about essentially the, Uni the United States' complete lack of oversight when it comes to campaign spending, they think that's corruption, okay? But it's not against the law in the United States. You know, Citizens United and, and, and all these other things, essentially there's very unregulated campaign finance in the United States. That's not against the law. Whether or not you view it as corrupt that individuals can donate a certain amount or corporations can, then that would get into, well, do you view it as corrupt through the lens of public opinion or it hurts the public interest, but it's not technically against the law. Other countries have completely different laws around campaign finance that are much tighter, in which case, if they were to look at the United States, they would probably say, you know, the unregulated aspects of campaign finance are probably, uh, we would consider corruption. Um, in terms of how to fight it and how to protect the people fighting it, I think there I would return to our, our levels or units of analysis. So, you know, this is kind of the, the nitty gritty of public sector management, but just like hiring the right managers who know how to oversee the people that work for them, 
Um, Larry, I know that you've worked in the health sector in Africa a lot. You know, you have to have regional health managers that are capable of actually making sure that the health facilities in their region, that the doctors are showing up, that the nurses are showing up, that the pharmacist is there. So a lot of it is just about how the public sector itself is governed mm -hmm. and where accountability can come from. You know, does it take a minister, does it take a president to go to the, the health ministry and say, you guys got to shape up, you guys got to manage yourselves better and make sure that these employees are following the law. So I'd say within public agencies, that's one answer. Another answer gets to that system level where if we think something's going wrong in the executive branch or, or let's just say um, an executive branch agency like the EPA or the State Department, um, there are other uh, checks and balances that could potentially influence how that agency operates. And so, for example, in the United States, Congress is, is given the power to investigate uh, the executive branch and actually uh, to exert some sort of oversight. Now, right now, we're having a legal battle between a former president, and we've had these battles before between sort of what, what, can, the, what can the legislative branch actually ask from the executive branch but the judicial branch as well is going to be able to exert some influence. So there are these competing institutional interests that could bring about reform uh, in those uh, in that regard. And last, I would say citizens themselves, um, if it's just reporting on corruption, if it's tweeting, you know, everybody tweets now when they have a problem with the airlines. The airlines are a private business, but, you know, you could what, what happens in other countries, for example, is India has this really cool app called I paid a bribe. And you essentially go onto the app, and if you had to pay a bribe, say, you know, at the airport or, or by a police officer on the road, you can report that. So citizens are actually really good uh, sources of information, as well as citizens, ultimately, if we're talking about a democracy, are those that are going to vote for the leaders that either pursue reform or not corrupt, or they're going to vote and support the leaders that are. So I think all of those are areas for, you know, where reform and checks and balances would come in. Yeah. I'm also thinking in this uh, in this area of uh, you know investigating corruption, the the role that the media might have, and then and then and whistleblowers, and then how do you protect these people? In fact, something I think uh, next month we're going to get into uh, uh, into uh, uh, protecting the media and freedom of the press and what happens to journalists in countries where they report on uh, official corruption or 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 activities and then they disappear. Or uh, or they're arrested, or or there is no freedom, you know, left to report these. How do you, you know, how do you see that 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 those? I mean, we have official branches of government which investigate uh, uh, corruption, but also you have people and you know entities bringing forward allegations and facts and and, and such. And Larry, I think that's a great question, and I think that is something that Americans really take for granted. You know, I think. A lot of us have looked at what's happened with Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine and thought, well, how can the Russian people put up with this, especially since they're providing the labor to go fight this war? And I think, you know, a lot of the news in the United States, unfortunately, has essentially become entertainment or it's become so partisan and kind of about the personalities that sort of straight facts reportage. I think we assume that we know or we can just get easily by reading this or that newspaper. And then we don't have a deep appreciation precisely for what you're saying, which is, you know, countries even today, I know, I know it sounds weird to say in 2022, but people really do live in information vacuums or they live in, you know, the only information that they're getting is going to be from the state or from this corrupt entity that, that's doing something at, in the example of Putin in Ukraine. And so if we have that understanding that people really don't have that information because they don't have access to free media, because obviously reporters in, in Russia cannot freely report on what's happening in Ukraine and have that be disseminated to everyday Russians, it becomes a lot easier to understand why they haven't just had some mass uprising against Vladimir Putin. So the media plays a critical role. The media played a critical role in the American Revolution. The media played a critical role in the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, so people's ability to kind of access, uh, you know, facts and and even some analysis, I think, is really critically important. So I, I think you're right, Larry, that citizens can't be good citizens if they don't have access to to good information that's provided from nonpartisan and independent sources like what we hope uh, the media is able to do. And I think there, you know, there is a reason 
that corrupt kleptocratic dictators kill journalists. You know, that that's not an accident. And so, you know, I'm very, you know, I'm very excited that you guys are going to be able to talk about that in your next session. But I think media absolutely is critical. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, this may open a can of worms, but uh, you said in your writings and broadcasts that free and fair elections are essential to a functioning democracy. And in fact, you participated yourself in election as an election monitor in countries like Afghanistan, where election yeah. fraud was rife and, and very obvious. You actually, you actually moderate a pod, podcast series called Neither Free Nor Fair. And uh, we don't have to look beyond our own shores to hear allegations of election fraud, some ironic, some, some cynical. But from your experience in observing and monitoring elections abroad, what observations do you have about the integrity of our own election processes in the run-up to our midterm elections? And do you have any suggestions for how we might rebuild trust in these processes here? Yeah, so the first presidential election I was able to vote in was in the year 2000. And a lot of the people on the call, I'm assuming, are, are around my age, uh, perhaps a little bit older, but you'll remember what happened in 2000 with Bush v. Gore and the butterfly ballots and the hanging chads in Florida. So, so since I've been able to vote in presidential elections, I've sort of had this trauma that things can go wrong. And then I started studying elections in other countries. And so I always sort of am nervous before every election cycle, whether it's in this country or in Afghanistan or Kenya or anywhere else, that it is gonna be free and fair. I think in a democracy, we can talk about corruption in say the health sector. We can talk about corruption in the education sector. We can talk about you know, corruption in the local police force or, or whatever. Democracies are built on free and fair elections. Like that is the core thing. And so if those are undermined, that to me seems so foundational then that we can't talk about corruption in the president's office if the person who's in the president's office was corruptly elected. So to me, you know, early on, I think I just thought elections were interesting and I had seen some elections kind of go sideways, but it, it really is fundamental that that is the place that in a democracy that can't be corrupt. Um, and if it's corrupted, then that's going to be a problem. I think in terms of what the other countries tell the United States, um, it's interesting because this is where the United States can learn a lot from other countries. Other countries have actually done this a lot better than the United States has. Um, you know, I think not only 2000, but I think there were a lot of reforms after 2000, and I want to recognize that. One good thing about the American system is if we find a problem or we find a weakness, we have the ability to improve it. Um, and, and, and there were a lot of improvements made, for example, to ballot design and ballot counts after uh, Bush v. Gore. In 2016, obviously, we know that there was infiltration into social media by foreign actors, and we know that foreign actors were able to actually breach the security of uh, all 50 states, as I understand it, their, their voting systems. We don't know that any vote, votes were actually changed. But, in 2016, you know, the forensics on that showed some serious weaknesses, and this wasn't something that made a lot of headlines, but the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, they worked really hard between 2016 and 2020 to ensure that that would not happen again. Even private companies like Facebook and Twitter were rethinking how they thought about the influence of social media um, and foreign actors. So that by tw so 2020, 2016, there were definitely problems. 2020, I think was the cleanest, freest and fairest election that the United States has had, at least in living memory. And so the United States has a lot to applaud by improving that and, and learning from the mistakes that they had made. The problem is now there is both the real issue of electoral integrity and election corruption, and then there's the weaponization of that issue, meaning you know, using, you know, lying about whether or not something has integrity or causing false alarms or, or making accusations that don't pan out or just saying that the election has been corrupted or it's not free and fair without any kind of evidence. And I think that's the issue now is that electoral integrity no longer is just about actually improving the system, but now it's a weaponized term. And, you know, it's not just in the United States and lots of countries when people lose elections, they just say, oh, well, it was all corrupt. You know, somebody somebody cheated and they stole it from me. Sometimes that's true, but sometimes that's just what you say because you lost the election and you're angry about it. And so I worry 
you know, electoral integrity is a serious thing, but the problem is you say that now and it just elicits all sorts of anxieties uh, on the part of Americans and people in other countries because it's been weaponized mm -hmm. and false allegations have been made and, and, and election observers have been attacked, uh, re media reporting on it, and then the actual officials responsible for conducting the election have been attacked as well, all the way through January 6th. In terms of the midterms, you know, we already have candidates saying if they lose, they're going to just say, well, no, they really won. You have election deniers on the ballot, up and down the ballot uh, in all sorts of races. You know, I think we'll have to see what happens. I, I don't have any reason to believe that the security of the system itself is a, is is vulnerable this time. I think we, we've improved that. But I think now what the real issue is going to be is whether or not people weaponize it and just say it and whether or not people go along with that and believe it and whether or not that's enough to sort of mobilize uh, a constituency or a group of people to cause damage like we saw in 2020 or whether at some point people are going to say, well, you know, if you say it was if somebody cheated, do you have any evidence to that? And then there's no evidence and then people say, okay, well, maybe, you know, maybe it was free and fair, or maybe it was fine. So I don't know, we'll have to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've had experience monitoring elections other places. And and obviously some of the places where you went had a history of ballot stuffing and things like that that, that really were corrupt and unfair. Um, so correcting the problem itself doesn't seem to be the only solution because we seem to have a fairly secure system. It's the perception and the trust in the process that goes a long way. And that's what, to me, it seems, what you've been saying and writing about. Uh, that that having a society that truly believes that their elections are free and fair is even more important than the fact that they are free and fair, because without that uh, that trust in government, people are going to you know give up, if you would, or let things roll the way that uh, that uh, that they will for people gaming the system. And so uh, I don't know what we can do about it, but. How optimistic are you that we can really do something about whether it's inherent human greed and its manifestations as kleptocrats and oligarchs and criminal kingpins and those who are who enable uh, people who enable them to continue to exert influence over major global financial dealings? I mean, let's get back to to, to the global. I mean, is there a way that I mean these things they're 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 not always state players that are that are involved it seems I, I know we've been trying to focus on on state but a lot of these things end up passing through criminal rings and uh and and, and so forth and and is there really a, a a global uh entity if you would other than the united states uh, you know trying to do things by uh, c controlling our own corrupt practices and and those of others who you know who do business with us, is there a way that that these things can be approached from the top down, if you would? Uh, and how optimistic are you that we can really get on top of some of these things? So I'm actually very optimistic, and and I'll in a roundabout way kind of come back to why. So so there are a lot of international conventions, and you know the OECD, for example, the European Union, the United States, and the UN, and, and things like that on trying to tamp down the things that help to perpetuate corruption, whether it's financing to terrorist groups, whether it's money laundering, whether it's offshoring and shell companies and stuff like that, the things that you could sort of do, particularly before 2008 and the financial crisis, it's really, it's a lot, it's getting harder and harder to do them. Even, even banking in Switzerland is becoming more and more uh, subject to uh, U.S. law enforcement peeking here and there and the Swiss uh, authorities cooperating. But Larry, I think one of the ways I would answer your question is to say, I think the United States, in a sense, is, is that role, and probably for reasons that are not really obvious. So you may think the United States is this behemoth in the world that exerts a lot of influence because of its military and economic power, and therefore, if the United States wanted to fight corruption globally, it would just happen because of that. But actually, I don't think that's exactly why the United States is well positioned to play this global leadership role. Rather, it's the fact that people love American dollars. And anytime there is a transaction in a bank anywhere in the world that is denominated in dollars, 
that goes through a clearing bank in Manhattan, which is in the Southern District of New York, which is one of the Department of Justice's federal districts. And so because the United States has the world's financial cap, uh, capital for anything in dollars, and the dollars, are, dollars right now are sort of the world reserve currency, the fact that this all goes through a bank, even if it's a small blip for a micro, you know, like less than a second, through a bank in New York means that the United States actually has oversight into cor corrupt actions that occurred in other countries that really don't have anything to do with the United States, maybe, other than the fact that there was some transfer of dollars. So, for example, um, so the Southern District of New York is, is very well known for going after international crime and public sector corruption because these banks are in Manhattan and the SDNY uh, exerts influence over Manhattan. Um, but the United States, to try to bolster its ability to go after these things, has created a whole body of law over the last 30 to 40 years that tries to get at this. And so the United States was the first country to make money laundering illegal, and that wasn't until 1986. They passed something, Larry, you mentioned the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. That was passed in the 70s, but it, was, it really got a lot of teeth after the late 1990s. And what that law says, and I don't think most Americans know this, is any American or any person doing business in the United States, okay, so if you're, a, if you're a French company, but you have any asset in the United States, or you are an American, if you bribe any public official anywhere else in the world, you are breaking U.S. law. You can then be held criminally liable in the United States, regardless of whether or not you're breaking the law in the country where you're trying to bribe an official, you're breaking U.S. law as an American citizen or someone who does business in the United States by bribing a foreign official. So the United States has that law, and the OECD has a convention that's very similar. The EU has similar laws as well to where, you know, the, it, it sort of builds this, this thing where it's like you can't just bribe an official in Nigeria as an American business person and think that you're necessarily going to get away with it because you're not. But that force of law is not coming from Nigeria necessarily. It's coming from the Department of Justice in the United States. Well, my, now might be a good time to talk a little bit about some of the recent Department of Justice investigations and large fines that have been uh, levied against foreign companies who have engaged in some fairly nefarious uh, corruption that resulted in some uh, uh, you know, serious consequences for, for folks. Um, and uh, you know, I'm speaking about the, the recent um, uh, uh, Lafarge uh, cement company uh, fine that was announced uh, earlier this week or last week. And, and I, I, you probably have some details of that, but also there are some other recent very large findings against uh, foreign companies uh, uh, acting internationally, but uh, um, with the Im implication that they violated this uh, US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Yeah, can I share a few of my favorites? These are the, these are ones that I picked out that I just really like, and some of these are actually in the Eastern District of New York, uh, as well as the uh, the Southern District of New York. A lot of um, organized crime is is prosecuted in the Eastern District, whereas financial crimes are prosecuted in the Southern District. But they have a they have a lot of information sharing, and they'll refer back and forth. So here's a couple of my favorite uh, on the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, for example. So Airbus. The French company that, you know, there's basically two companies that can make commercial airlines, uh, Airbus and Boeing. Boeing is American, Airbus is French. Uh, the Dust Justice Department uh, charged Airbus, they had to pay $3.9 billion um, because they, they had seen that Airbus had tried to bribe officials in the United States, France, and the United Kingdom. And they were using third-party businesses to try to go about this. And so that was a case that the Justice Department actually won under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, but that's $4 billion. You know, if you are, if you're an investor in a publicly traded company that let, let's say it's French and you're French and, and they're paying, you know, they're having to have these payouts to the Department of Justice in the United States, you know, that is hopefully going to cause businesses to think again about doing this. And, and $4 billion is a lot of money. Um, but you can imagine that that that's a huge knock against Airbus. And there, there have been a lot of these high, high profile uh, cases. Deutsche Bank, which has come up in the Attorney General of New York, uh, Letitia James's uh, a, a complaint against the Trump family and the Trump organization. Well, Deutsche Bank has been investigated by the Justice Department and they had 
they also basically were charged by the Department of Justice and they had to pay $130 million by basically just being the bookkeepers for the people that were paying bribes in other countries. They were using Deutsche Bank accounts and Deutsche Bank was essentially providing a third party service and holding the accounts of these people engaging in the, this bribery transaction. But just simply by doing that, they were held accountable to the Department of Justice and, and forced to pay 130 million. Chapo, El Chapo, one of his crimes, he was tried in, was it the Eastern District or the Southern District? Uh, he was, he was uh, oh, he was actually tried in the Eastern District with a lot of other districts helping a lot of it had to do with gun crime and, and stuff like that. But one of the things that he was found guilty of was money laundering conspiracy. So that was one of the things that they were able to get uh, El Chapo on was essentially the, 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 the financial crimes that go around by running a criminal uh, entity, a cartel. And the last one I'll say, Larry, that you brought up is one that just came out two days ago. So it is, it's the French company Lafarge, who is a, uh, a cement manufacturer. And they were charged uh, by the Department of Justice for supporting ISIS in Syria by essentially bribing ISIS to allow them to have a cement factory in Syria that would not be subject to ISIS attacks. Now, they, according to the Department of Justice, they paid about $5 million in this bribe to ISIS to not be attacked. Well, the Department of Justice two days ago said that they had to pay over $700 million dollars to the Department of Justice and forfeiture. And you know, just for those of you following at home, this apparently, it's not just the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, this is apparently being prosecuted under the first corporate material support for terrorism profit, uh, prosecution. So this is the first time that the Department of Justice is successfully prosecuting a company for directly funding a terrorist organization. And so that is sort of, you know, $700 million. I think that's going to send a huge message. But if you're a French company bribing ISIS in Syria so you can build cement, the SDNY or the Department of Justice may come after you. And you may have to pay a lot of money in a fine if, they, if you're found guilty or if you, if you plea that out, uh, which, I think they, it, which I think they did. And I think that's actually still ongoing. So there could be future uh, liability that comes out of that case. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Well, so President Biden recently defined the fight against global corruption as a, quote, core United States national security interest. And he made it an official priority for his administration. And I recall that uh, George W. Bush had previously said that he believed that a policy promoting the anti-bribery uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act helps to propel our country's moral authority across the globe. Do you really think that, I mean, do you, do you agree with that, that that is something our foreign policy should focus on, and that by doing it, it does propel our moral authority if we still have moral authority. And uh, uh, you know, how, how, how do you feel about, uh, about that? Yeah, I mean, maybe it is a little bit namby-pamby of me to say, but I, I do think it matters. I think it, I think it matters not only for moral authority, but I also think it matters for US national interest. I mean, Lafarge is a great example. Whereas if this company is giving ISIS $5 million, that is allowed, I mean, ISIS is probably spending that money to buy weapons or do things that would either directly affect the United States and their military assets or the allies of, of, of the United States or otherwise create sort of a, a foreign policy problem for the United States. And so I think the United States saying, well, you know, one way that we have to go after terrorism is through terrorist financing. And in this example, it happens to be a French you know, cement manufacturer, that's who we're going to go after. Um, I think that matters a lot to actually support U.S. national interests or in the actual interests of the country. Now, you, I think you could say, well, like with the Deutsche Bank example or, or you know, Chapo or, or, or the really obvious things that are just bad for America directly. I think with the Deutsche Bank, you could say, well, if Deutsche Bank, which is a German bank, is just providing bookkeeping and accounts for other, other people in other countries paying bribes, why does that really matter to the United States? And I think there the moral authority may be important, which is to say, look, a financial crime is a financial crime. Bribery is bribery. It doesn't matter if it's bribery to ISIS or if it's bribery to a French, uh, you know, a government official or even an American official. Mm -hmm. We are going to try to uphold the rule of law 
and impose what we believe, you know, not only what our values are, but actually what our laws are and what our statutes say um, and to further, you know, the cause of, you know, freer markets, uh, to try to get rid of corruption, to get better reform, perhaps democratization, perhaps improvements to human security. Um, this was a lot of the thinking around the Magnitsky Act, which a lot of people may have heard of in the last few years, which allows the United States to basically sanction and seize the assets or ban travel from any foreign official who was seen to have committed human rights violations. It was first applied to Russia, but now the, now the United States has a global Magnitsky Act. So if they see that there is a, you know, a dictator in Latin America, or they see a, a corrupt uh, oligarch from Russia um, who they believe is in violation of the Magnitsky Act, they can seize their assets in the United States. They cannot allow them to travel to the United States. And I think that be, because it's primarily focused on officials that have committed human rights violations, I think that's very much exerting the, the uh, America's view of its moral authority, for sure. Yeah, thanks. And, 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 and truly, that's one of the reasons why there are councils on world affairs, to help us understand what U.S. foreign policy is and why it is important for Americans here that we, that we do stand for the rule of law, for human rights, for democracy and the other things that you mentioned, because those things help to create a world where a stable world. Uh, and there's always been something until recently that was bipartisan, that we agreed that's the role the United States should play abroad, that projecting that moral authority, if you would, uh, gave us a credibility and helped to create an environment where we're safer, business can be conducted in, in, in a free and, and transparent way and so forth. So thank you for that. Um, so you talked about some high profile cases that uh, that have been been prosecuted. What do you see the trajectory of U.S. enforcement of the of the of the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act as being? I mean, a couple of those things, they're big, but are we focusing more energy on those things now than we have in the past? And what dynamics are in play that might help or hinder these efforts, you know, in policies to 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 really do what? President Biden says we want to do is make this a core part of our U.S. foreign policy, and if you would to, to cash in on it by by you know creating an environment where we can compete uh, openly and uh, violate this. Our uh, uh, people who violate it are trying to be punished. If they cash, yeah, yeah. I think so. I think the United States would have to do kind of two big things, both of which are in motion, but may not happen. I think the first thing is that if the United States wants to continue to play this role, at least diplomatically or morally, it has to hold itself to its own standards. And therefore it has to prosecute its own public officials who have violated its own laws. Now the United States actually does do that all the time. But a lot of times the, 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 the cases are not as high profile as the current case or cases are potentially with the former president. And so I think for the world to say, well, money laundering, you, you know, the Americans say money laundering is wrong when it's a, a Russian oligarch or if it's a Latin American dictator. But what about money laundering or lying about assets when it's a, a president or former president? And so I think I think what happens with with the various Trump cases, I think, will set a clear precedent. And I'm not interested in, in making the argument that the precedent is that he is guilty and he must be found guilty. Rather, I think what the precedent has to be is that the law is followed at every stage. That there aren't, it's not seen to be political favors. It's not seen to be a political process. Of course, there are political dynamics to it. But if the Attorney General of New York has enough evidence to prosecute a case uh, or to, su to sue the Trump family or the Trump organization, and she thinks she can win a judge or a jury, she should. If the Department of Justice thinks they have enough evidence on whether it's documents or January 6th that the former president committed a crime or and they think that they can win a jury, they should pursue it. If they can't, then they shouldn't. If the facts aren't there or they don't think they can persuade a judge or a jury, then they shouldn't. So to me, it's the United States living up to its own rules more than it is he is or isn't guilty or is or isn't found guilty. And I think what, what's, what's been interesting about a lot of this is 
um, you know, there's been sort of a, 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 a I've never seen so much sunlight. You know, you know, I re we're reading all these memos from judges and the circuit and the appellate and the, you know the lawyers and blah blah blah. Like that's usually not that's usually not consumed by the public in, in in corruption trials. And so I think what's good about this is the media is able to report it, and we have access as the public to a lot of what's going on. But again, I think it's going to the United States is going to have to deal with this set of cases and this person in a way that appears that it's upholding the rule of law with respect to its own public officials in the way that it exerts to other countries. So I would say that's number one. Number two, I think is just continuing to do what the Department of Justice has been doing and the SDNY has been doing in, in other, uh, other aspects of, of the US system, which is going after these cases. And you know, I think it can be a high profile case like Airbus is high profile. I think it can be kind of what feels like run of the mill, you know, uh, bad banking, like the Deutsche Bank thing. I, I think it could be something that wasn't high profile, but is is very important to U.S. national security, like Lafarge. And I think the United States should continue to invest in those types of assets. And you know, by the way, the SDNY doesn't just go after big corporations either. They help. They have helped uh, reclaim stolen art uh, from World War II and from the Holocaust. They 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 tr you know they've done all sorts of things that are sort of the things that help uh, build confidence in a legal system that the public is maybe not always aware of. They do public corruption, big and small. You know, a lot of public officials that we may not have even heard of. They go after uh, uh, banks that are not as high profile as Deutsche Bank. And, you know, for every El Chapo they go after, they're going after a lot of lower level mafia bosses or cartels th that haven't made the headlines that are also, you know, the that the, the Justice Department thinks are, are threatening, uh, you know, either breaking the law or somehow threatening U.S. national security and then using the law to try to uh, be an instrument uh, for good, or at least for the rule of law. And so I think that's kind of where the U.S. would have to continue to go. I do think the U.S. also does, obviously, in its conduct of its foreign policy, do a lot of things that are unseemly, perhaps illegal, perhaps that a lot of people don't like in other countries. You know, certainly during the Cold War, they did that a lot. I think that happens less and less. Um, but I also think, you know, the United States basically abiding by its own rule and living up to its own standards, as well as partnering with other countries to try to, um, to fight corruption in their country insofar as it affects the United States or it doesn't, um, then that's what they should do. Do any other countries have uh, their own versions of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and do they enforce them? And uh, are there countries that you think have improved their record of addressing uh, some of these uh, endemic corrupt practices? Yeah, so the answer is yes and yes. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act may have been the original impetus, but the EU and the OECD have done a lot. UN agencies have done a lot. Uh, a lot of regional organizations, even the African Union, has its own conventions on anti-corruption and bribery, the Organization of American States. Um, and then a, a lot of what happens is that countries will work bilaterally with each other. So one of the things that's important, for example, when the SDNY is perhaps um, investigating a case that involves financial crimes that may have hit Deutsche Bank, and Deutsche Bank has a branch in uh, Manhattan, if the United States has a good relationship with Germany, they may be able to get German officials or, or share information with them or vice versa to say, could you give us the records of their accounts that are actually in Germany? And so there's a lot of bilateral working that goes on behind the scenes. Um, so in a way, like the SDNY is like a, it, there is a lot of foreign policy, even if it's kind of low level diplomacy stuff that they're uh, engaged in, but those bilateral relationships matter a lot. The United States does not have that type of relationship with Russia for example, or Saudi Arabia or Iran or North Korea. So in, in those cases, it's, it can be much harder. But where the United States has really good relationships with people, that, with countries, they're able to share that information, even perhaps extradite people to the United States to face charges. Um, the other thing I would say is that the, um, the degree to which this all it's it's always going to be a cat and mouse game with you know terrorist groups and cartels and mafias and the US government. So every time the US government finds a new way to crack something that you know has oh this is how we figure out if in this bank account there may be illicit funds, 
you know, those criminal enterprises are going to try to find new ways to do stuff. And so one of the reasons this is interesting is I don't think there'll ever be a moment at which the United States or any country is just capable of stopping all corrupt actions or money laundering or something like that. But there's this constant evolution of, of you know, of cat and mouse where the United States will figure something out, but then the, the criminal enterprises will innovate a new way to do something. And then, more, you know, so it keeps going. It's exciting for me. I'm not in law enforcement. I was a college professor. So it's exciting for me to see it and study it. Um, but for law enforcement, it sort of always keeps them in business because they're always having to think one step ahead and then try to figure out, well, what's the new way that they are engaging in money laundering, for example, and how can we go after that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have just a couple more questions before we open this up to the to the general Q&A and a number of questions have, have been coming in. Um, one thing is curious to, to me, and we touched it a little bit with the Justice Department's activity. A, a, a recent former president thought, said he thought the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was stupid because uh, we should be able to bribe our way into getting business. It's, a, it's, a, it's an impediment to, comp to competition versus all the companies from countries that, uh, that allow this to take place. So it's not an even playing field and we obviously lose a lot of business because we can't bribe our way uh, into the business. So do you think that the, uh, that the Justice Department now is intentionally trying to level the playing field by going after more of these foreign companies? And do you think that we, this can be successful? I've had to compete internationally against uh, companies that, uh, uh, that uh, don't play by the same rules and it makes it difficult to do business. Um, but uh, what do you think about that? It does. And I mean, I think if, like for example, if Eli Lilly has the medicine that works, and they can't bribe or they don't want to bribe a Nigerian official, but a Chinese company comes or a Saudi company or an Indian company comes and the, 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 the medicine that they have has not been regulated as well or it could even be fake or, you know, it, it, you know, and they are able to bribe, then Eli Lilly loses out. But the people in Nigeria lose out because they don't get the better drugs, right? So I do think there is tension there. And I do think it's, it's a fair question to say, you know, are U.S. regulations or, or, or laws ever hindering things that would actually be good for the market, good for the company, good for the, the patients, good for the country that they're operating in? So I think always trying to think about how to balance that is important. But the other thing I would say is I think actually Letitia James did a really good job when she gave her announcement of the suit against the Trump, Trump, Trump family and Trump organization. I think she did a really good job of answering this question big picture, which is that, you know, er everyday people listening to, okay, he, he may have overvalued an asset or Deutsche Bank allegedly gave the Trump family a loan that if, if it had been you or me applying for that loan, we wouldn't have gotten because he was overvaluing assets or undervaluing assets or whatever. So isn't that really just between the Trump organization and Deutsche Bank? Like what interest does the attorney general of New York have, or even the, the people of New York? But I think Tish James did a very good job of saying, these are bad for the social good. These are bad for everybody. Because, I mean, just think about Deutsche Bank. If Deutsche Bank gives a sweetheart loan to somebody based on false accounting, that's a loan that they're then not giving to somebody else, right? That, that can cause market distortion. So if you're overvaluing or undervaluing assets in a real estate market, for everybody else who's in that real estate market, you're creating distortions for that. Moreover, if you allow certain people to break the law, even if it is the cost of doing business, well, who, who decides who gets to break the law and who doesn't get to break the law? Like, what if I want to go to Deutsche Bank and get a loan I, as a college professor and I lie about, you know, what my, I mean, are we all lying? Are we all just supposed to not play by the rules? And so it's like, yeah, in any one instance, you can say, well, is this really that big a deal? Like, did it really matter? But Tish James does a good job of saying yes, and everybody has to be held accountable. I think there's also the deterrent effect. You know, you want, you know, presuming that she has something there and that she's going to make her case, she also wants the next Donald Trump not to make the same decisions that the old Donald Trump made. She wants the next Eli Lilly or whatever company it is not to have made the mistakes or, or, or broken the law the previous companies did. So I think the deterrent and the demonstration effect is really important as well. And anytime, and because this is so high publicized, if, if, you know, if he has seen, or the Trump organization has seen to get away with it, then, you know, who, wh wh why should John Q. Public not think that they should be able to get away with it? Or why should they be held to a different standard? So I think that's why rule of law is so important is it, it should be blind. 
It should be blind to the power and influence of any person and everybody should be held accountable uh, in the same way. Even if they have different levels of wealth, even if they're playing different parts of the real estate market, they can't break the rules and not be held accountable. Yeah. Well, to close this part of the, of the session, I'll ask one question, which you've answered a little bit, but would you say that the US, the, that, that we are leading in the global response to international crime and corruption? I think we are. I think the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act gives us a very strong mandate. And again, because dollar transactions all go through Manhattan, I think that puts us in a place where even if we didn't want to, we would have that responsibility on our shoulders or else, you know, every, you know, every uh, uh, intermediary bank in New York could just be used to finance all manner of, of bad things. So I think because of that, um, yes. Now, one of the things that people have talked a lot about is, will this create, will this potentially um, cause, for example, the European Union to try to become laxer because perhaps it, people will want to deal in euros and if the European Union has fewer laws around that, then the euro, the euro could become a stronger currency. Um, for any of you who are British or know London, London is famously um, uh, open for business. If you are, if you are, uh, potentially committing illegal acts. The the, the restrictions uh, in London are a lot looser um, than I think most people realize. And so there's a lot of criminal activity that goes through markets in London. But, you know, the British pound right now is not seen as a world reserve currency the way the dollar is. But you can imagine that other things could try to replace the dollar or try to replace the United States. They'd have to be a bohemoth. And it would have to be the case that other uh, criminal enterprises want to transact in euros and pounds and never dollars. But right now, because they are transacting in dollars, I think that puts it at the feet of the United States. And I think the United States is having to play this role. Yeah, well, that's good. And that's a good takeaway for us, too, that uh, that we are standing for the rule of law, we stand for it around the world. And we all will benefit if, in fact, if these things get uh, get adopted um, and competition will be uh, will be easier and free trade will happen more. Yeah, I, I've always thought that uh, that uh, offering to pay a bribe is a, is a quick road to the bottom because then becomes a, a, a bidding war. How big of a bribe are you going to pay if we just if there's another one on the table, you know? And so that's a very slippery slope if you're if you're trying to do business. Right. And you you want to if you're bid if you're bidding you want to bid for the best medicine at the lowest cost that's the easiest to disperse. You don't want to be bidding for the public official who's allowing you to disperse fake medicine or the public official who's going to get all the medicine and then not distribute it, right? So, so I think you're right. It's like you, you want to bid on the market in a free market or, or as free a market as can be, not bid for access to public sector corruption. And that's the issue. Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, uh, I don't want to give too many of my own anecdotes, but that's what opened the door for us to move into Nigeria was they had bought uh, a very large amount of, uh, of an antibiotic from China that not only turned out to be not what they had ordered, but it was actually poisonous and was killing people. And so uh, they had no way to assay what they bought. Uh, they, whoever had done the deal, you know, ended up uh, distributing this medicine. Uh, and we had an opportunity to go in and uh, help them develop a system where they could at least figure out what it was they were buying so that, uh, you know, we could, we could end up bidding for it. There's not a lot of business for uh, uh, for the lily products necessarily in Nigeria. It's a poor country by and large, except for those people who have all the oil money. But uh, uh, we're moving into this next part of the of the program. There's this, and this can get exciting because we opened it up to uh, to our audience, and we have some a lot of interesting folks on the on the line this evening. There are a couple of ways. If you let me know you have a question to ask, just uh, send me a note uh, that, you, that you would like to ask it, and you can unmute when I call you. And, uh, and jump in and ask the question yourself. Or you can go to that chat button at the bottom and, uh, and uh, click on my name, uh, Larry Cimino, send me the question and I'll be happy to ask it for you. Um, I know that uh, I see Rich Pilnick is on the line and he has a question uh, and uh, I want to turn it over to Rich. Would you unmute yourself, Rich, and, uh, uh, and you. ask a question? Thank you, Larry. Uh, Dr. Long, uh, I grew up in, uh, in Brazil. I was a third generation Brazilian and, uh, and I lived all over the world, thanks to my wonderful career at uh, Eli Lilly. And by the way, the Foreign Crop Practice Act taught me uh, a number of places and a number of times where we had won bids and tenders and we just had to walk away from them because there was, it, was not, it was the wrong thing to do. 
But what I'm shocked about, and I'm embarrassed uh, about Brazil, is the, the depth and the spread of corruption uh, in Brazil and how it's gotten progressively worth, worse generation after generation, from the private to the public to the political arenas. So my question is the following. If it's taken generations to learn the bad behaviors, won't it take equal number of generations to unlearn these bad behaviors? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow, th I, th that's a great question. And as you know, so I believe that the Petrobras scandal in Brazil is seen as the, in terms of denominated dollars, the largest corruption scandal in the history of the world is in Brazil. Um, and you're absolutely right that one of the, the issues with Brazil is that it is so endemic across seemingly every public institution, including now prosecutors and judges, both political, you know, both all, all sides of the political aisle. And what started off as maybe some reasonable or, or easily understood um, prosecutions has now become the cycle of sort of everybody prosecutes everybody, whoever's up on the docket, they're the ones, you know, and, and it, it's sort of everybody's so deep in it that there's no kind of vision of where you would get reform from. Um, so, you know, you don't have the kind of story of the crusading prosecutor going after the mafia in Italy with 24 hour protection. And, and finally the judges are, are doing the same thing. Like you don't have that glimmer of hope um, is my understanding of the case. I think I would throw the question back to you. I don't know. I don't know of a case that I think has so much corruption across so many levels and institutions, but it's also such a wealthy country. And, and so that, and it's a democracy, right? So wealth and democracy are things that we think correlate with less corruption. And so to me, Brazil has always been this, um, this sort of paradox. So I think I would throw it back to you and ask you what you think in terms of like, does it just get so bad that people are like, well, okay, why, I mean, that they just overthrow the entire political class or does it, people, people just live for the next hundred years with this much corruption? I mean, I honestly don't know. And, and, and no, it's a fair, it's a fair pushback because my grandparents, when they were, they arrived in Brazil, uh, some came from Europe, some came from, some came from Russia, you know, they were hardworking, they were humble, they, they progressed, but the generations then were maybe taught by the Portuguese because the colonial Portuguese brought in their, their habits, but they seem to have perfected. And I don't mean to be too uh, ironic here, but they seem to have perfected generation after generation after generation, uh, grabbing land, grabbing power, grabbing. And it's gotten to a point where uh, even the everyday citizen will basically say, well, I'm going to vote for that person. Yeah, they're corrupt and they steal, but they get things done. So therefore, we're going to we're going to vote them because they'll get things done, and they'll accept it that way. But then that tells me then that the map is never going to get better. It's never going to return. It's never going to improve. But we should stop it there. No, but I I, I do want to just highlight for the audience that I think Brazil is truly exceptional in this regard, and and so I think Brazil really is like the hardest case to try to figure this out. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, Brazil has had cycles of military coups and democratically elected governments. And so, you know, I'm not saying that there would be a coup in Brazil, but, you know, there is, we've seen how previous eras have dealt with leadership that at least some of the political class doesn't want. Could be voting them out of office, but it could be the military intervening or some, somebody else intervening and overthrowing that class and then trying to start over. Um, coups are sort of becoming more frequent in Africa, for example. And so I think, you know, I, 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 I have a lot of uh, sympathy for, for Brazilians in the Brazilian case because it's just hard for me to imagine. Like, I really don't know where it would come from. Um, but, I, you know, I hope it improves. I just, yeah, I'm not sure. Thank you. And the upcoming election is going to be interesting down there. It's quite close, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, there have been some, uh, some interesting uh, questions and comments that kind of go together. Uh, some of them, and I think it's fair questions, where does the, where does the US get the moral authority to purportedly uh, provide this authority to implement uh, any of these laws? 
And is it simply good business to operate in this way? Or is this really a moral high ground? And do we have the moral authority to do it? And, you know, and other comments are that uh, we kind of arrogant if we think that, you know, we can impose our moral authority on other people who may not approach morality in the same way that we do. Yeah, so we decided that we had the moral authority. And so I think that's why we exercise it. But I do think that a lot of people, when, when America does the right thing, people notice. Um, I think the United States is not alone. You know, I don't think the United States is unique in terms of its values, um, in terms of wanting to fight corruption. You know, I think, you know, the American Revolution was basically a revolt against the corruption perceived by the king and the way that the king was abusing his authority and using parliament and, and all these things to basically cheat the system and make people worse off. So, you know, France, you look at you look at the French Revolution, right? Corruption in the ruling class, corruption in the church, corruption among the wealthy, like never trickling down. But then you have cycles of revolution and in, 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 in Republican governments, I mean, small r Republican and democracy, and then it goes you know, emperors and then, you know, it just cycles and cycles and cycles. And so, you, you know, I don't think the United States has any unique claim to wanting to fight corruption. Certainly Brazilians are aware of it. Mexicans are aware of it. South Africans are aware of it. Um, I think it's just because of the U.S. might. I think it's because of the U.S. dollar that it's in a position. And by the way, not every American president or, or aspect of government or time period has that been true. You know, I don't think the Trump administration would agree with what the Biden administration is doing now, for example. Um, and certainly a lot of people criticize the Obama administration after the financial crisis for not being um, more uh, robust and well it, it essentially didn't do any investigations of of what happened that caused the financial crisis maybe that would be different uh, maybe if Obama were elected in 2024 and and there were a financial crisis or whatever that he would change his thinking on that or maybe he regrets some of that I'm, I'm not sure but I think the United States is just in a position because of its economic might and its political power that it can exercise that it 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 either has to have sins of omission or sins of commission. So it can either exercise what it believes its moral authority is to fight corruption, or it can do nothing, in which case corruption is going to reign supreme because again, all those dollar all those dollar transactions are going to be used to support it that are are going to go through US intermediary banks at least. So yeah, I think it's I think it's a it's a somewhat of a dilemma, but I do think I mean one of the one of the things that causes me to make this a little bit US, less US focused is when I talk to Kenyans and Afghans and South Africans and Brazilians, they say the same thing that we say. Um, they just if you, you know they they see the same problems. They don't want it to occur either. They think it's bad for business as well. Um, so yeah, again, I don't I don't think the US is really that unique. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in fact, I think one of the things that it could do to improve its its position is to make partnerships with civil society, with media and other countries, um, you, you know, and not always just doing things that are seemingly good for business, but are actually good for the people that are affected. And Larry, I like your example of Eli Lilly and the, and the medicine from China. You know, maybe it's good for Eli Lilly's bottom line to distribute their, their medicine in Nigeria, but it's also good for the Nigerian people if they get the real medicine. Right. And so, you know, I think that helps to build the moral case that the United States is, is asserting, even if the United States very frequently does not live up to its values um, yeah. to the degree that we would all like. Yeah. Um, Ray Montagno wants to ask a question. Ray, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Um, thanks, James. This has been very, uh, very interesting. Uh, I just have a comment first. Um, I think there was actually a study that was done in the 2000s that actually showed that um, the U.S. companies did not suffer from enforcement of Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And, I, you know, I wish I could, I didn't have the research in front of me here right now, but I, I th thought in terms of market penetration and profitability, U.S. companies operating internationally that abided by the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act actually did just as well as other companies. So uh, I, I don't think, and, and again, there may be some more recent research on this. I don't, don't know if you know that or not uh, on this issue, but I'm sure it's somebody else has studied this 
uh, because it would certainly be an important question, the impact on US companies. So, but that's that's just sort of a comment. The, the other, the question I really had was about other types of um, sort of corrupt behavior, for example, like shipping hazardous materials to developing countries, um, which may not be uh, financially based, but more in, in terms of, uh, I hate to use the word convenience based, but you know we can't dis dispose of that stuff domestically. So we find a country that's willing to take it and uh, it may not be illegal in their country and it doesn't violate the terms of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So are there other kinds of corrupt behaviors that are, uh, you know, that we are, are addressing kind of with our laws in the United States that uh, maybe we are, we're not addressing them yet, but we should be? That's a really good question. And I think that's why the Lafarge case to me is really interesting is because <clears throat> a lot of bad things correlate with other bad things or correlate with each other. So where money laundering is happening, oh, why is this business entity in Mexico laundering a bunch of money through? Oh, well, because it's the Sinaloan cartel. Oh, so now the money laundering, maybe that's what you catch them on, right? This is the, this is the Al Capone dilemma. The money laundering is going along with human trafficking, the, the narcotic drugs, violence committed both in Mexico as well as in the United States. Um, the Lafarge thing is, is primarily about terrorism, but it's, it's essentially foreign bribery to a terrorist organization. And so I think when the United States thinks about financial crimes, a lot of which we've talked about, I don't think they think about them often in isolation of who is actually, who is actually conducting this and are they a criminal enterprise? Are they, um, are they a, a, a foreign business that has basically been cheating or doing bad things? I mean, oil and gas companies are always sort of under the eyes of, of governments, like the Prevazon case that SCMI prosecuted uh, the, the Russian oil uh, uh, giant um, a, a few years ago. And so I think, yeah, I think all these things kind of go together. And I, I don't think the United States takes a narrow view. I don't think we should take a narrow view either um, but, you know, it's, it's like the money laundering may be the thing that gets you what the ultimate thing is, which is, oh, this oil company that's based in another country that's basically subject to no rule of law has been spilling a lot of oil, has been, you know, doing, doing other bad things. They've also been money laundering. Well, we're going to get them on the money laundering. Um, but yeah, with an eye towards it, it's, it, we're trying to reduce the negative externalities that these businesses or these uh, countries are pr otherwise producing. Um, I have an anonymous uh, question. As we've heard recently about politicians with investments in companies regulated by committees they oversee uh, <laughs> and offshore accounts that uh, politicians and other power brokers retain to hide their wealth. How does this fit into the web of corruption and, and how, does it, how does that negatively affect the rest of us? So the good news there is I think this is changing. I mean, if you think this is a problem, then I think the good news is this is changing. So the, I believe the Panama Papers were revealed around about 2015. And if you don't remember, the Panama Papers was this huge document dump. It was millions of documents from a Panamanian law firm, Mossack Fonseca, that basically had been used to help from every country, including, by the way, Iceland. Um, uh, uh, basically use offshoring financial instruments that are not really available to the rest of us uh, to conduct uh, economic activity to hide their assets from taxation or offshore them for whatever reason and all the rest of it. A lot of this wasn't necessarily illegal, by the way. I mean, that's an important thing to say. Um, what was revealed was actually in concert with Panamanian law and, and, and other things. Um, but what it did is it really revealed the degree to which the global elite are playing by different rules, at least because they have access to things like a Panamanian law firm that they can hire that helps them establish a shell company so that they can offshore assets that don't have to be taxed in the United States. But that, I think, is becoming harder and harder. Part of the reason was the financial crisis in 08. Part of the reason is that things like the Panama Papers and other document leaks have revealed these <clears throat> And that it has caused countries to actually look at these things more in depth. Um, I believe it was the prime minister of Iceland had to resign, basically, because they were seen to have lied about some asset that was revealed in the Panamanian papers. I may be wrong about that. Um, 
So these things happen and a cynic says, well, gosh, look at how rotten the whole system is. And that's right. But if that causes people to then shine a light on this and then say, well, wait a minute, we need to actually argue for new laws that, that try to curb this. I think that's an important thing. You know, I, I can't remember a time in my lifetime where I've heard so much conversations around Congress, members of Congress regulating businesses where they have stocks. I mean, it, it almost like didn't occur to me that that would even occur, that happened until the last couple of years. And so, you know, so we're talking about it now, right? And people didn't used to talk about it. And there's even, there's been some, you know, I don't know what the state of it is, but there's been some movement, I think, in Congress to try to make this change. Now, of course, part of the reason it's it's hard, but part of the reason it may work is both sides of the aisle have uh, have stocks and, you know, things in, in various companies that they may be regulating. So you could say, well, because everybody has their their uh, their finger in the pie, then maybe it's going to be hard. But maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's precisely because everybody would lose and gain to a new equilibrium where there isn't, you know, it's not normal for members of Congress to be on committees that are regulating industries where they have they have stocks or other assets. So I think, you know, I'm hopeful that the more we talk about it and the more that people put this in at the feet of politicians and make this a voting issue, that we could actually see real reform. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, Claire Collins, one of our board members, has a has a question, and I'm going to turn it over to Claire to ask. Um, hi. Um, this is kind of controversial, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I didn't just uh, hear a rumor. I've been reading about this online. It's Vanity Fair is one of the uh, investigative reporters and, and some of the other places. But um, the, um, the banker who facilitated the uh, loans to Donald Trump when no one else would loan to him um, was named Justin Kennedy. And he's the son of Supreme Court Justice, former Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy, who um, resigned conveniently, and then we got Brett Kavanaugh. And just that's a, an instance of sometimes it's not always money changing hands, but it's power. Um, although um, I believe uh, Kavanaugh had some debts that suddenly disappeared, so there may have been some money there. And then uh, Mitch McConnell said that, um, you know, the FBI could have 48 hours to investigate him and uh, on some, you know, sex assault charges, but, you know, it would have investigated finances too. And I think the FBI just kind of gave up on it and didn't even try. But, um, and at the beginning of uh, Trump's term, um, there was a, uh, I don't know, a chairman or a secretary of ethics, I forget his name, but, um, you know, he was like congressional and uh, presidential ethics, and he just resigned and he was never replaced. Um, do you know, is that being investigated or will it ever be investigated, this connection between the younger and the older Kennedy? And um, and also that uh, Justin Kennedy uh, was basically groomed by Ivanka and Jared Kushner, and they became very good friends before this. Obviously, it looks like a deal to get Anthony Kennedy to resign so he could be replaced uh, by a right winger. Has yeah. So I have. So I don't have any special inside knowledge. Um, I have read similar allegations and the connections there. Um, I don't know whether, I don't know if there is a precise law that is alleged to have been broken that is, that, that would inspire a, a prosecutor to investigate. I, I, and I'm not sure whether or not the, the Kennedy tie to Deutsche Bank is going to come out in the New York Attorney General's case or not. Um, I, I, I'm just not aware of that, but I, I, I suppose it could. Um, but one of the things you raise is, let, let's just assume that some of that is true. It may not be illegal for uh, Anthony Kennedy to, you know, all of that could have technically been legal, but some people may say it's corrupt, it's unseemly, it's wheeling and dealing, it's not about money, but it's about power, it's about access. 
um, and there may not have been any law broken. And but it, even if the facts of the case are suggestive of corruption, it could be the case that lots of people who get to the the higher echelons of power use that access both to bolster people up there with them or to try to jockey and uh, outplay other people that are up there. I think that's why. I think that's why on the part of the public, it's always important to support the rule of law and, and hear what investigators are doing, but also say, look, there might be a whole number of things that the public doesn't like that are never going to be something a prosecutor takes on to prosecute, but we should still be talking about it, and we should still be making an issue, even if it wasn't a violation of the law. Um, and I and I, I think, you know, will we ever know about it? Um, there's been a lot of reporting done on all of the webs of the Trump organization and their relation, you know, the members of it and the family with various um, potentially nefarious business and, and political interests, both in the United States, but also in other countries. I think it's a very, very, very dense network of, of entanglement. You know, if you were to do like the FBI string thing between the pictures of people that you see in a TV show, I think it would be enormously complex because this organization, I mean, the Trump family has been in business for longer than Donald Trump's been alive. And so their assets and their relationships with people in politics and in business globally has been, you know, decades and decades in the making. Um, but I do think there probably will, the more that things are reported on and things come to light, you know, is it, I guess one of the things that's going to be interesting for me is I'm not sure it's going to change anyone's mind now, but I do wonder in the future if it's going to cause people to change how they view uh, Trump and the Trump organization retrospectively. Like I wasn't alive during Richard Nixon and Watergate, but what I've read of the historical record is much more serious than the way I've heard people who were alive talk about it because so much more has come out about what actually happened. And so I think for the future, I think it's who knows, you know, and maybe people just also just want to forgive and forget and just move on. I mean, we, I, I'm not sure, but I think, I think this is going to be a story that continues to not specifically the Kennedy story, but the sort of what the Trump organization was up to. It's going to be a story that continues to develop just because there's so much potential liability there across various jurisdictions. Thank you for handling that in that way. And, uh, and Claire, thank you. And uh, I, I suppose I, I need to uh, assert that ICWA is a, is a, a nonpartisan organization. And therefore, as, a, as an organization, we don't take a stand one way or the other on, on political issues. And while a question didn't come in in our chat, I did get a number of comments before that reflect the current preoccupation of the right-wing press on Hunter Biden and allegations that, uh, that uh, he, though he wasn't in a political office and no indictments have been made, that uh, there seems to be a whole uh, media circus going on now about uh, what uh, he may have allegedly done to uh, uh, create access and what have you. Well, his father was vice president. I don't know if any of that's true or what, uh, what it was, but uh, I, I, I don't want to get into a specific political situation here, but I think before we turn it back to, to, uh, to Ray, I want to suggest that what you said is that we're talking about these things now. And that's really important. That's why we felt this program was so important at this time, because not only are we talking about them, but we're talking about the importance of the rule of law being applied equally. Uh, whether people are doing business in other countries or whether we're trying to use our quote moral authority in other countries, well, we may not be ex exercising it so much at home. And therefore, um, you know, if we're going to apply the rule of law, we'll have that moral authority, obviously, to make this a centerpiece of our foreign policy and, 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 and have the credibility that we need and deserve if we're going to operate around the world. Uh, and, and really influence uh, the way business is done, the way governments operate, and way, the way corruption is or is not uh, carried out in these countries. Uh, I'd like to ask you to make a, a closing comment, but I would like to thank you so much for taking time to prepare and to participate in this program with us this evening, uh, Dr. Wong. It's been fantastic to have you on. And as I said earlier on, uh, you're probably the right person that we found to, to talk about this topic. And thanks for sharing your insight with us this evening. 
Sure. Well, I really appreciate it. I've, I've really enjoyed the, the questions and the conversations. And I guess, you know, one of the things I would end with is, you know, there's there's no obvious answer or solution out there. And I think that that, again, is a challenge, but it's also it's 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 what should motivate people like your organ, you know, members of your organization to think about and talk about like no, nobody's going to come on high like a deus ex machina and say, well, here's the answer. Here, this will get rid of all corruption or here's actually what Trump did or here's actually what Clinton lied about or here's actually what happened with Watergate. Right. It's it's for you all to think about and decide for yourselves as well and to think about, OK, like are these the things that we should be pressing on the Hunter Biden thing? You know, regardless of whether or not he did anything illegal, is it unseemly for the 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 son of the vice president to get a position at a you know an oil company in another country, or an energy company they probably didn't work very hard for? Is it okay that Ivanka and Jared are maybe talking to members of, of the judiciary or people that are related? You know, all of these things are are things that I think we struggle with, but there's not there's never gonna be a single prosecutor or judge or court or uh, impeachment proceeding or whatever that's going to basically say, here's what the answer is. This is exactly what happened, blah, blah, blah. So I think a lot of it is incumbent upon citizens to kind of think about, talk about, educate themselves on, and then try to work towards reform um, and and in, in kind of think about that as the, the issue rather than just thinking that there's a simple answer out there or that the people in charge always have the answer and it's whether or not they they pursue it or not. I don't think anybody really has a great answer. I think we all just have to sort of try to figure this out and think about ways we can improve it. Um, but we can't wait for other people to tell us what that is or what that means. So that's kind of my my big thing. Okay, Ray, I turn it back to you. And um, you know, thanks for the opportunity for uh, us to have this discussion this evening. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, just a couple of closing pitches here. Um, the books for Great Decision Series are available. Uh, if you want to go online, look at our store you can purchase the the uh, books i think there's a discount up through november 1st on certain purchases so if you want to go check those out uh, again if any students or teachers out there are interested in the academic world quest you can go check out our website um, our next program will be uh, pr press freedom in crisis it's on november 16th and it'll be at the same time seven o'clock uh, you can sign up for that now those the uh, uh, registration button is available on our website for that as well. So again, I want to uh, thank uh, Professor Long for his uh, insightful comments tonight, and Larry for you uh, managing the uh, the dialogue uh, very effectively. I appreciate that a lot. So uh, with that, we can uh, log off. James, if you want to stay on just a minute, I got something I'd like to say with you, and Larry too as well. Thanks. Okay, everybody else can sign off. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Great to see you. Thanks for joining. Ray, are you going to bribe me?